Hello, and this is the after show afterthoughts of Lenny Gaffey Straight No Chaser. You see my panel of fabulous women. Um, I, I cannot tell you. Here we are. We have Angela Rem. We have Sandy Howell. We have Robin Joyce Miller. We have Sandra Fudge Thornton. And when, then we have Fudgy Fudgy, Deborah Fudge Rem. And both of them are the fudgies because Sandra, your friends used to call you Fudgy too. That's right. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so here we are. And all of these wonderful teachers, thank you all so much for really bringing, bringing my, this is my dream come true to have a, a panel of educators here. This really is um, because I think it's so significant and that we honor you all and thank you all for uh, just hanging in there and being with us because we were all students one time I was, I was, I guess I was a good student, but I could be a pain in the butt at the same time. So thanking, thanking you all for uh, always hanging in and, and doing that. Now, I do want to pick up where we were when, where do you think the education system is going constructively? How can we make it you know, benefit our children. Um, I think one of the things that Robin has said earlier was it is the importance of the ed the administrators to be yes, ones absolutely. who are, you know, who are open, yes. who are, are willing to have that vision when you have an administrator that you have to be challenged all the time. We want to create, and Lehigh University, and, and I will say this, uh, has a wonderful program where it is a program for people who, once they, they are finished with it, it will be print, they will be principals. And it's an incredible, I sit in on some of the seminars on it. Um, it is an incredible eye-opening situation where they come into the program and it is encouraging them to be open about what it is that they, how they are administering their education. So what do you think about that kind of situation, or is that going to be helpful as we educate the new administrators? Um, is that we need to start at the very beginning, bringing them in, wanting to be that hungry? What do you think, Angie? Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, I think um, you know, I I'm a I'm a Lehigh alum from their Ed Leadership ah. Program. Mm -hmm. They do a great job there. But one thing that I got out of their program years ago, and I'm sure mm -hmm. they're still doing this, is teaching administrators how to create this shared vision. Yes. How do yes. you have a vision with your staff, um, with your parents, and, and yes. with your Absolutely. writers? It's just so incredibly important. And to put that vision, place it up, you know, on a child-centered vision, um, you know, and ideally in a way that incorporates, um, you know, the arts. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that, um, you know, allowing teachers um, um, time for interdisciplinary, like for so regular education teachers can meet with art teachers and music teachers, mm -hmm. and their technology teachers so that we can create these experiences um, that really, you know, provide access points for all kids and administrators are at the helm of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. you know, Agreed. hopefully. They can create programs that have more depth, mm -hmm. and less, um, you know, so that children can have these experiences. Exactly. Robin? Well, in my experience, I found that um, the administrator, first, the first principal that I had who was interested in the arts was Corinne Rillo, and she was really wonderful. However, mm -hmm. it was important for her to send me out to training. And as the teacher, I had to come back and show what I've learned and really right. work that out with other teachers. I think mm -hmm. the staff development is very yeah. important because um, um, what some people, for example, some administrators, well, I had teachers say to me, my principal is not interested in the arts, mine, whatever. But I told them, you have to show that your program that you're doing is valuable. And that's by putting up posts all over the school, posting the children's art and, and with, with criteria, with vocabulary, you have to make, I find that the teacher has to make it important enough so that the principal and people come, coming into the school take note. Exactly. And that's what I did to really, you know, really make things happen and to be a facilitator and to train. And even now I'm going to schools here in Cape Cod talking today, I was at the high school and talking to teachers about what they can do 
to make a difference. And I think that to, uh, staff development is very important. Yes. Sandra? Absolutely. Absolutely, I agree with you, Robin. Staff development is so important. I taught English language arts and once a month we would meet and have literature uh, training. Yes. And it was so helpful. And like you said, we would bring it back to the teachers and teach them. Also, parent involvement, so important. Parents getting involved in what's going on in the school. Yeah. So important. Mm -hmm. Communicating. Mm -hmm. Sandy? Know your audience. Um, I've been out of the, I've been out of the ed game since 2014. Um, the principal that I had, he was what I call one of those instant principals, thanks to um, Bloomberg. He had only been in the classroom for three years. He didn't know anything. So again, look at your, look at your principal. What, what are they all about? Are they about the community, about yes. school, or are they about itself? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to be the salesman. Um, nine times out of 10, you've got more going on than they do. Be able to sit there and listen to them and figure out, okay, what are you about? How are you about? How are we going to get this to the community? Um, and again, know your audience. Know what your community is about. My community was transient. And that was a transitional because I had a community where multiple languages were spoken and not just Spanish. It was Urdu. It was Hindi. It was everything. And so you had to now reach these parents. And sometimes you couldn't reach them. Mm -hmm. and, and my girlfriend said to me, when I'm all upset, she said, Sandy, running water, flushing toilets, and paved roads. <laughs> That's their basic. That's what they understand. I, I'm, I'm like, oh, good Lord. So they have to see the value of the, of the education for their children. If it looks like the art program is going to benefit their kid, sell it. The administrator has to sell it, okay? The kids are going to, you have to sell it to the kids too. They're going to have to buy into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Fudge. Well, I'm agreeing with everything everyone says is that everyone in that school or in that um uh, community has to be on the same page. And one of the things that I heard a, a while ago, I was listening to some young people uh, who are still teaching uh, talk about what has happened in their school because COVID has changed things. Yeah. Uh, what, mm -hmm. what teachers went through and what parents went through sort of changed the way in which they see how <laughs> they get children to learn. And one of the things uh, that I think is important is that we can't expect parents or even new teachers to come in and want to go to a lot of these workshops without giving them something towards it. And that means either materials, a stipend that can help them. You know, we have to start to look at um, education as a business because I know my daughter, when she works late, she's going to be compensated at the end of the year with a very nice bonus because she works in the private sector. And we need mm -hmm. to realize that sometimes we're asking people to donate their time and efforts when they have to pay for a babysitter or they have to pay for mm -hmm. transportation. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I um, heard this young teacher tell us is that they have a stipend program for their parents and also for the teachers. And they feed the parents when they come in to workshops. So we have to look at the all-inclusive way that we could change the system. And sometimes that's what uh, education has to do. And um, yes, everyone has to be think that we also need to listen to the students. You know, I'm a child of the 60s. And one of the things we used to do in class is sometimes sit around in a circle and talk to um, talk to each other about poetry or language. We may have to do that again, you know, and let children know that. Well, that their that their opinions are valued. Yes, I see that I that my connection is unstable. So maybe you all are seeing me as frozen because I'm seeing you as, you know, 
Um, uh, I can't, I can't. So start again, Fudge, just finish what you were saying. Oh, I was just saying that everyone has to be on the same page and that we have mm -hmm. to listen to children and figure out what mm -hmm. they COVID has changed a lot in the mm -hmm. sense that children may need more um, uh, knowledge about taking care of themselves and feeling good about themselves. Uh, exactly. There's a lot of depression going on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the arts can come in and help too, because I really do feel that everyone has art inside of them in mm -hmm. some way. We just have to tap into it. But mm -hmm. I also feel that there are times when we're asking people to donate their time and they need to be compensated. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The practicality of it, it being a business. I mean, I mean, you know, we all know that it's a calling, but, you know, that whole thing has, has, has I think, uh, been regarded a little bit too much that it's a calling and, and like little mushrooms or little urchins are the ones that feed into <laughs> us and give us money for, you know, our bills to pay our bills and everything else. I mean, you know, no, we need to be able to be compensated for mm -hmm. as much as we love what we're doing. You know, when you love what you're doing, they say it's not work. And it, it's, it isn't work when you love what you're doing, but, but Mr. Con Edison and Mr. PP and mm -hmm. everybody else doesn't well, want to hear about that. Yeah. 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 Don't forget the supplies. Yes. You know, and the credit card companies, when it comes time and, and mortgage payments, everybody has to, everybody wants to be able to be compensated. So, so that we need to, to also relook at how we regard the education system and those of, of those of, who are in it as uh, as participants, you know, the educators. I think that that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, Robin, I do have a question for you because I did listen to your piece, which is absolutely wonderful. I mean, I, I think that you all, um, I want, I, the reason why I have uh, this question is that uh, I want to know if, tell me about Africa available for people to, to, okay, let to, me, let me tell you how it came about. Okay. First of all, what I do these days, I educate, but I'm all about, this is something I was born to talk about, which is race. When I was a teacher, I did a piece of racial harmony poem. So, um, and also as a child, I was very embarrassed and ashamed of my African ancestry. I really was. When I heard that a, um, my 18-year-old cousin from South Carolina came up north and told me that our family came from African people, at five years old, I ran around screaming, I'm not African, I'm not African. So, mm -hmm. but recently, but I speak now in churches. So I'm asked to deliver messages in churches. Mm -hmm. And so I, and, and, and up here on the Cape, it's mostly white churches. I belong to a white church. And in fact, this Ethiopian Jesus um, piece up here. Wait, let me see if I can. Yeah, that piece is in my church. The uh, I, that's the original, but they have that. But I was asked to speak, and I talked about social justice in um, in Christianity in the Black Church. So when I did that, I also talked about my own shame, and I was asked by someone. The, um, like about a week before someone said, I do a program in church called The Child Within. And, um, and Robin, do you have a story that children can hear? So I said, they could go with your sermon. So I went, and I thought, <laughs> I don't have a story, but I can write one. In instantaneously. So, yes, so yes, I said, oh, yes, I'll I'll do. yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes. So just like someone else said, I believe that was Sandy, possibly who said, that um, I teach the way I wanted to be taught. Mm -hmm. I wrote mm -hmm. the story that I wanted. Well, first of all, when I became an art teacher, I never had a good elementary art teacher. We just cut out Valentine's. Mm -hmm. I became the art teacher that I never had for myself. You know, turkey, there you go. Man, I was sick of that. <laughs> so I want, but, but, but when it came to, when it comes to Africa, this is, I wrote a story called, tell me about Africa, because this, is my mother was my first teacher and she read to me and she told me stories. She was a storyteller. So for me, I would have wanted, I wrote the story that I would have wanted my mother to tell me about Africa. Mm -hmm. And since I did a show, I do a Black Lives Matter series and I've done nine of them. Mm -hmm. And the last one that I did was called Black Kingdoms Matter, Africa, the motherland. And so I talk about, um, Africa before um, colonialization and imperialism. Yeah. So th that's where you're hearing part of what I wrote 
in a poem called I Am an African mm -hmm. and talking about the beauty and positivity of Africa. Mm -hmm. So it, what it is, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, and I, I'm trying to figure out uh, how to communicate this story on another level, on this level, um, uh, as, as, my, as, as my nonprofit starts to formulate and, and we're doing a season. To, as a preamble or something, but you have to be able- I want that to be a children's book too. Yeah. I, would, yeah, I see the vision, I, the, the pictures of this as a children's book. Okay, so, I, so, so what, what I'm, you know, I, I, I got your recording and I really wanna sit down and talk to you about um, presenting it as a piece uh, that, that should have, that, that should go out. And one of the things that I told Robin, Robin said, well, it's, it's really great for, you know, young people of people of color to know their background. I said, it's even more important for me because I know my background. I, I grew up differently um, in that I went to a private school where Mildred Johnson, who was the, the, um, her uncle was uh, um, James Weldon Johnson, who wrote, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Negro natural anthem. So I was very proud of myself. So I have always thought that there should be something to for us to give to people who don't know about us also. Mm -hmm. I said, because that is where, that's where fear starts. That's where ignorance starts. When mm -hmm. people don't know, you must discover yourself, but you almost also must inform other people about your pride in, in it and how to make that work. The book is absolutely fabulous, but it just needs it, it you know, the idea of the book, but I, I, I keep on trying to think. I keep on listening to it. I listen, I've listened to it about four or five times. And, um, you know, and I'm saying to myself, what can happen with this? This is a wonderful story for everyone to hear uh, about the pride that someone takes about establishing their history. Let me just, and I'll just quickly say this and I'll stop talking. But um, the ahead. Black Lives Matter series it was when George Floyd was murdered that mm -hmm. do it. That's Katuit Center for the Arts. Um, the director said, "Robin, it's time for black white people to hear black stories." And I said, "I'm the one to tell you all." Some black <laughs> and so I, I have a video with me doing that, going, "I'm the one to tell you." Okay, so so oh, okay, um, that's what happened. And so I'm always educating people here. So it, my being t a teacher has never stopped. Of course, mm -hmm. and then and then and and you answer then the next question: What is everybody doing now? Because we all know that it doesn't stop. It may the job stops, you know, the the um, working for the board of education of whatever you know place you're in. But what are you doing now, and and how is it connected to you know um, what you've been doing all your life? I'm going to go out of order. Sandy, tell me. I am a multimedia artist. I graduated from the College of New Show with the background in pottery and photography. Um, my default is quilting. Uh, so um, I just recently sold a piece. So now I'm working on working on quilts. I'm working on one for my grand, my new grandson. But I quilt. Um, I enjoy it. Um, it is my expression. Um, it is my color, color for my soul. Um, I love fabric. Um, before I quilted, I was a garment maker. So that, that's, that's what I do. Uh, your quilts, right your quilts, uh, because my grandmother and her, and her cousin, um, who lived to be 105, they, I have their quilts and their quilts uh, are pieces of material uh, at, uh, at different times of their lives. So do your quilts tell a story? Do you, do you sometimes tell Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. I'm not a traditionalist quilter. Mm -hmm. I don't always cut up the little pieces and make the little patterns, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? Um, I throw the pieces down on the fabric and see what comes up. Um, mm -hmm. I like to see what happens. I'm exploring more. I'm opening up, opening up myself more to it. Um, Debbie can tell you this is the dullest one will ever see me in clothing. I usually wear bright colors and everything, but 
that's it. And that's, that's my, my color thing. That's, that's what I have to have mm -hmm. and fabric all the time. So mm -hmm. that's what, and that's what I'm working on now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just want to go back oh. what Sandy said, because thank goodness for Sandy, you were asking us what we're working on. I work with a group, uh, DKG, which is a Delta Kappa Gamma group, but we're all educators, former educators, and still some are still teaching. And one of the things um, I decided that I wanted to do, I don't know why this idea came to my head, was a quilt. During COVID, I was thinking about all the people who, who were not home like we are, as many of us retired teachers, and some people who weren't able, like my daughter, Sandra's daughter, to stay home and work but had to be out there even before there was a vaccine. I just felt for all of these workers from the delivery guys to everyone in the hospital. So um, I thought of a gratitude quilt and I mentioned DKG because they gave uh, me the money to buy the material. Sandy had to give me a lesson on how to start making a quilt. I had no idea what I was doing. I threw the idea out to the ladies in the group. They said, great, they gave me the money. And I said, now what do I do? <laughs> My friend Sandy came to the rescue, showed me how to cut, you know, she cut the squares for me. I went over to her house for a little lesson. And I have to say that at the Manhattanville College, which is a school I'm working with, they have that gratitude quilt hung in the lobby of their building. They have a building called the Clark Center for Social Change. And um, it's hanging there now. The students worked on it with me. But I, I have to say, I had Sandy on speed dial every minute saying, okay, now what do we do? And I mean, it, it's so beautiful. We put it together and it's definitely a quilt that when things, I guess, um, are a little more open in our, in our uh, city, we will display it and, and, and let all the workers know about it. But yeah, I, I still love working with people. Now I'm working with college students and I go up to the college um, every other week week and work with college students. So we're working on another project now, but the Gratitude Quilt was really a big project that I started working on and found young people that were interested in social change and they worked on it with us. And uh, that was great, but I don't think you do anything alone. You know, I think that it's always, you always connect others. And it was a wonderful way to bring about this project and now we're working on another one with uh, the students at Manhattanville College, which is in Westchester County. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, and what about you, Angie? Well, I first of all like to say I have enjoyed being in the presence of such beautiful, dynamic, passionate women. Like it's so wonderful. What, what a great way to spend a night with all this. <laughs> Truly. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, um, I've been retired for two years. So I am, um, I'm a beginning harpist. I've been taking harp lessons and oh, wow. able, yes, it's behind me. I've been able to go into some um, oh. older folks and play for them. Um, I'm volunteering with a homeless program called Family Promise through our church and um, Catholic charities. I've been going in to work at their soup kitchen and um, I'm writing a devotional for people who um, we've had several friends and family who've been either shut into a rehab home or have cancer. And I was calling and praying with them and um, I'm turning it into a book, 40 day devotional. Um, so I'm you know, writing a few pages every day on that. But I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. That's fabulous. Mm -hmm. All right, Sandra, I've seen you. Sandra, you've been walking around and you know, <laughs> moving, moving. You don't think, you think I don't see you. I have great peripheral vision. I said, now, what is she doing in this new house? She just walking this way, walking that way, trying no, to find I hear them. little, you know, I'm hearing little sounds that just move. So any little sound I hear, I'm going to, you know, go and check it out. Yes. But so, um, besides, besides this wonderful project now that you have this wonderful, beautiful home that you, you have now just moved into and, mm -hmm. and, and is, and is creating your own personality for it. Yes. Absolutely. You doing? Not, not, not that you have any enough time to do anything else, but that, because <laughs> I understand. That's a lot. Yes. But what I'm doing, Cal, is I'm educating my grandchildren. Mm. I have two biracial grandchildren. So I'm reading to them and teaching them a lot about their history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm yeah. doing, I'm spending a lot of time with them. Oh, that's yeah. absolutely wonderful. You and know? that's a lot. 
Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I think, it, you know, I think and the fine. responsibility of being able to, when you have biracial children, is mm -hmm. informing them of their complete history of, of everything so that they make their own choices later on in life yes. as to, you know, how they want to, to, to navigate in this world. You know, yes. that's a very important that's thing. Important. Yes. All right, ladies, it is a half hour. And I, I knew this was not going to take 10, 15 minutes, but I'm going <laughs> to let you all go. I mean, you all have just been absolutely fabulous. I'm hoping that the audience really appreciates all of the words of wisdom that you, you, you know, you shared with us where we, we could be going, what we, you know, should be doing. And I thank you so very much. I'm going to stop the recording now. I just want to say my own goodbye to you right afterwards, and then I'm going to let you go. But thank you everyone for listening to the after show afterthoughts. And thank you to my wonderful panelists of educators. You see that they're all wonderful, vital, beautiful women and, and that they are still that's contributing still everything to their communities and to and to young people and to older people because we can't forget them that everybody still learns all their lives so that we, you know through the arts and through all the things that they're doing just keep on looking you know keep move, moving forward there's a there was i read something one day if you can just do something once a day that makes someone smile and don't tell anybody about it beautiful you know, that that's really a gift of life well, thank yeah. you, ladies. Thank you very much. And we're going to end now the after show afterthoughts. Bye-bye now. Thank bye you. Bye.